Hello, I'm Dave Moitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm heading to an auction to check out the sale of late model vertical tillage implements. Then we feature an Ohio farm's conversion of a machine shed to grain storage on all around the farm. The engine man, Ray Bohax, is back with another one of his great repair and maintenance tips. And then after these brief messages, I travel to Iowa to tour a shop built to sustain a feedlot operation. So please stay tuned. Welcome to Top Shops. A good shop is an invaluable asset to any farm, but they're especially essential to livestock operations where a good shop is in constant demand. Just ask Ron Christensen, who feeds cattle with his son Clayton, as well as his brother Kent and his son Kurt near Spencer, Iowa. Several years ago, the Christensen sat down to plan out a shop that would meet their current and future needs of this growing operation. Let's go talk to Ron Christensen about the results of that planning. Ron, thank you for letting us come out and see your shop. What were you working in prior to this? Well, we had a old building that we built in 1979. It was a cold storage in a shop, and the shop part of it was 30 by 50 with a 18 foot overhead door, and it was heated. It did have a concrete floor but uh, tools and everything, we were just really struggling for size at, on today's operations. Right. So your need for a shop was uh, pretty uh, cute because you have a busy operation here. Tell me about that. Well, our operation is uh, consists of myself and a son, uh, also a brother and his son, and we have a feedlot cattle operation that we grow 500 pound uh, calves up to 1500 pounds right. uh, for livestock auction or market. And then uh, we also have a mainly uh, corn operation, a few soybeans, but uh, oh, we just tended to break things and needed uh, a bigger <laughs> shop to, and, and we wanted to be prepared come right. field work time. So you talked about going to a website where you actually had a, there was a planner on this website where you could illustrate the shop itself then, and then you could move in equipment and that would size it. And you use that a lot to kind of help size and locate stuff. Oh, that was a great uh, tool. Um, it was uh, FBI uh, Buildings has a website and you can go in and it was graphed and it was according to, uh, Oh, size of equipment mm -hmm. and we, we started out with a certain size building and we had zones where you want your welding or fabrication, where you want your repair work done. Um, for our shop we had a race car area, <laughs> you could put in uh, doors, windows, uh, we have an office. You could take all those things and off of a legend and put them in and they were size. Here's a great tip if you're planning a new shop in the future. All the passageway doors in the Christensen shop are ordered four feet wide so as to give ample room to carry in supplies or evenly easily drive in an ATV or a UTV. So walk me through how you then came to the layout. You have facing towards the east, you have two doors that access the building. Yeah. Uh, the smaller door is off to the south then. And that's, you use that for most everything, right? You said? Yeah, from pickups coming in, payloaders, feed wagons during the winter right. time. Just about anything that squeezes through right. that door gets used there. Now, and then off to the left of that door, you have the large overhead door. Yes. And that is how wide? It's 40 foot wide by wow. 20 foot tall. No kidding. So you can get anything in here, a 12 row head on a combine, for yeah. example, yeah. with the header intact and even the bend extensions up because yes. it's so tall. Yes. 
That's rather a unique door, isn't it? Yeah, yes it is. It, it, in, I like doing research and part of it was, was uh, I looked at the bifolds, uh, oh, swing out power doors. Right. And uh, th this one was kind of back in old fashioned times of old fashioned garage doors that I used to have on an old garage. And uh, I liked the design. I thought it was very simple. Mm -hmm. Now on the south side of the building, that's where you really put your office and then other areas. That would be kind of the traditional loft, storage loft. Yeah. And how do you utilize that room underneath that loft that stretches across the entire southern end of the building? Well, we'll start in the east side of the, underneath the loft is my office. And that, uh, I didn't want any doors uh, straight to the outside of uh, the office. I wanted them to, uh, people to come in my office through the shop. Right. And then I have large windows in my office that, I'm not a person that wants to be in the shop. I, I'd rather be outside, so I put large windows in uh, office to look outside. Next to that, then, you put the combination uh, bathroom and laundry and changing area. Yeah, changing area and, and our heat's there too. Our in-floor heat is right. also there okay. in that room. Now, what's next to that, the, the room that's next to it is unique. I've never seen this in a farm shop before. That has a door on it and that's your lube room, right? Yeah, and that, it all came because I, I'm welding or uh, cutting something and oh, I'd have flammables really close. Oh, sure. Oils and Oh, what's a concern? Next to the step that goes up to the loft, that's your kind of your tool area, isn't it? Yes. What, you've got a workbenches in there. Yep, uh, we had workbenches. Uh, I keep all the tools there. We try to deal with mobile tool units, and that didn't seem to, like it worked very well. Right. We were always, I couldn't supply enough tools to supply three, um, four different areas. This shop is really feature rich uh, with a lot of uh, little, well, not little, big and little, uh, well thought of ideas that you had. First of all, you have in-floor heat, which has become more common. Mm -hmm. But a shop this size, that almost was required, wasn't it? Uh, the in-floor heat for me is the right thing. It, uh, I keep it as standard 54 degrees year round. Yeah. We're working with sweatshirts today. Yeah. Uh, if you're outside and it's 10 below, you can still come in here and it's not really warm, it, but it's just nice. But if you're bringing a feed wagon in here full of snow, It'll melt off and uh, you better be doing it pretty quick if it's underneath and why pretty soon you're going to get <laughs> dripped on really quick. I've seen a wide variety of drain covers in the years that I've been covering shops and I appreciate a good cover design when I see one. The Christensen's built theirs from three inch channel iron welded to inch and a half by three eighths inch thick rails. Other little things too, you put a, you have Wi-Fi in here in two different locations yeah. because you're working with a computer at any different locations yeah. in the shop, right? Yeah, the computer is such an important part of our operation. Just, we'll tackle a project that we have no idea what to do or uh, hired help's car. How do we change this? Well, we go to the computer. You somebody's the, somebody's got access to that. You have the laptop out. Yep, laptop out, and you just pull it out and research it and uh, right. do it. The Christensen added two wall-mounted air conditioning units to their shop to dehumidify the structure during the height of summer heat. It was one of those features that may appear to be a luxury, but actually is a necessity, as it makes the shop easier to work in and thus far more productive. I put two in, um, building's pretty well insulated. Now what we're really trying to do is take the edge off that if De it's- Dehumidify de more than anything. Dehumidify right? it a little bit and uh, uh, they work great. You know, if you got a welding project or something in the middle of summer and it's 85 out, mm -hmm. uh, this really helps that. Or if you worked all day and it's time to work on a race car, you uh, at the middle of the night, you, yeah. you feel like, kind of coming back yeah. out and working on it again. I noticed everywhere I'm looking around here and behind me too, we have what does not look like farm machinery. You guys, your son's in the, in the race cars. Yes. Dirt track. Yes. Yeah, so that's kind of a, uh, the great family hobby that you have. Well, I, I'm very fortunate. I get to uh, work with them all day and then we get to play at night. Yeah. Or work on a race car at night. 
So that, that, that's been a very enjoyable deal. And, and these are dirt track cars? Yep, uh, modified dirt uh, track, IMCA dirt track car yeah. and uh, IMCA modified sprint car. Yeah. So it, it's been, a, I've told people that it makes us better farmers. Oh, because you're enjoying yourself in the evenings. We have to resolve all the issues. <laughs> There's issues that happen on a racetrack and you have to learn to resolve them. And uh, either mechanically or uh, personnel wise or whatever, you have to resolve them. And uh, as far as mechanics, and you have to be an engineer. How do you keep floors in a shop of this size clean, considering that this is a feedlot operation with a fair share of dirty equipment needing servicing? Well, the Christensen's answer were these floor sweeps, which readily paid for themselves both by saving time as well as by producing cleaner floors when brooms produce more dust that gets suspended in the air. Well, I'll see you again on another Top Shop tour. Hi, I'm Ray Bohax, and welcome to the Engine Man segment of the Successful Farming TV show. Being part of the Successful Farming service team, I welcome and invite you to contact me through sfengineman.agriculture.com to help you with any problems that you may have with farm equipment or even your wife's car. But over the years, I've had many, many farmers contact me, and I have found that there are a lot of cooling system issues out on the farm, be it with the combine during harvest, whether it's a tractor, sprayer, or what have you, or the pickup truck or the grain truck, there's usually a good majority of the questions I receive are cooling system issue related. And I think part of that is rooted in the fact that people don't truly understand how an engine is cooled. The misconception being that the radiator cools the engine. The radiator does not cool the engine. It is the liquid's job, the antifreeze, to cool the engine, and it is the radiator's job to cool the liquid. And to prove that this is correct, some of you may have a boat, and many boats use lake water, or what they would call ocean water or seawater, and don't have a radiator. So that proves that the radiator does not cool the engine, it's the liquid that cools the engine. And since that is looked at the wrong way, it causes a lot of diagnostic issues. So what I'd like to do is explain a few things about radiators and do a quick walk around. This is a, ra a piece of a radiator core from an engine, and there are many components to a radiator. The tank would be here, and that solders onto the core, and then these are the fins and these are the tubes. The tubes actually carry the coolant, and the fins touching them is where the heat dissipation occurs. So the, the tubes carry the liquid, and then the fins actually take the heat from the liquid and put it into the atmosphere. Now, oftentimes, you would look inside the radiator, and this one is not a good example of that, is that these tubes are very clean. There's no corrosion built up whatsoever. If you look inside the cap and see corrosion in the tubes, then it is apparent that the flow is being blocked. But there is something that happens that is not commonly known. It is called fouling, F-O-U-L-I-N-G. And what that is, is is the formation of deposits at the bottom part of the radiator. If it's a cross flow, it would be in the lower tubes. If it's a north, south, up and down, it would be at the bottom tank. And what that effectively does is diminishes the size of the radiator and makes it act as if it's smaller. It's very easy to determine if you have radiator fouling, use an infrared gun with the engine hot to measure the temperature across the core. Contrary to what you would think, the cold part of the core is what is blocked because there is no hot cooling going there. And if you're wondering where I am today, I'm at the Firestone Research Facility for their farm tires in Columbiana, Ohio. This is the home of the AD2 technology and the original 23 degree tire design. So it's a real cool place and we want your engine to run cool. So you have a blessed day and if I could help you in any way, please contact me, thanks. Join me at a sale to see what a Land All Vertical Till implement sells for after these brief messages. You know, one of the hottest trends in agriculture today is vertical tillage. The concept is to run straight blades or slightly concave blades instead of the traditional disc blades. Now you run them at a slight angle to both 
cut crop residue while incorporating that residue into small amounts of dirt to anchor it to the field, but it also helps readily dry out fields. Since it was first introduced in the late 1990s, vertical tillage, or VT, has grown by leaps and bounds. Today, over a dozen companies offer a VT machine, and one of the most popular vertical tillage implements on the market is this Landall 7431. You know, that's what attracted me to this 26-foot wide version of the Landall VT implement, and that's what made me look at it to, at today's sale at Cook Auction. As background, this is a 2012 model equipped with a rolling harrow, and it appears to be in good working order and ready to hit the field, although you might have to sharpen the blades a bit. Now, before this land all sells, I'm gonna go talk to Scott Cook, a Cook Auction, the firm putting on today's sale, to get his feeling for the price trends on tillage equipment. I'm talking with Scott Cook of Cook Auction, and we're looking at that 2012 Landall 7431, and it's a 26-foot vertical till machine. So vertical tillage is a great way to size residue, but it also has other uses as well, or other appeals for people that wanted to buy it. Yes, uh, around here, you know, with the rains coming at times, we might have a month's worth of rain. Uh, and so the guys like to take those vertical tillage tools out and uh, open the ground up real quick so they can get it planted in case it's going to rain in two days again. So that's something they like to use around here. So if I'm looking at that, I really should be concerned about the discs on that, right? Yeah, the disc blades are obviously the most expensive thing to repair. And if they're getting worn down, you just, if you buy a used one and it needs to be replaced, oh. they are expensive. We're heading into planting season and guys might be picking that up at your sale here, which is being held in March. Is that going to put a little price pressure under today? Yeah, they're going to be more apt to buy it this time of year than if it was last fall. Oh. So in general, there's more people looking to buy that type of equipment now than they would be, let's say, three months from now. So I'll put you on the spot. What do you think she'll bring? It'll bring in the middle 20s. Really? That's a pretty decent price compared to what they have been selling for in the last several years. Yep. That's what it should bring. Well, thanks for that observation, Scott. Let's go watch the 7431 sell. 17, well, there certainly was interest in our land all vertical tillage machine. The final bid on the 7431 was $24,000. I hit the internet and found six Landall 7431s up for sale. They were all 26 foot wide implements like this unit. Their dealer asking prices ranged from $33,000 up to $47,000. And what about auction prices? Well, there were a total of six 7431s that sold recently for between $30,000 up to $36,500. That tight bidding range indicates the values of such machines as well established. Now that's the advantage of going to the internet to research what either dealer asking or final auction prices are before you head out to buy. You can come to auctions like this and bid in confidence or negotiate with your dealer and have a good idea when you're getting a good deal. Now, you can get more information on used equipment price trends by reading my Machinery Insider reports and every issue of Successful Farming Magazine. You can also pick up my weekly insider information when you go to agriculture.com. And for more information about Cook Auctioneers, go to the website at cookauctionco.com. I'll see you again next week on another Steel Deals report. After these brief messages, we feature the engineering genius behind a machine shed converted to grain storage in Ohio. So please stay tuned.
Uh, I'm Vincent Woodman, and our farm operation is uh, about 10 miles south of Clyde, Ohio. And uh, we run out of storage every year when we have to haul to town. And so in order to remedy that, we built this corn barn. And it's a uh, post barn, but the posts are at four foot centers. And uh, we cable it uh, three cables lengthways and every other uh, eight, uh, eight foot intervals, we have other cables that go into it. And they're high enough that the skid loader can get underneath the cables. It's uh, got an auger system in the top of the building and a door in the very peak of it. And there's the first auger in it drops it in at 20 foot mark. And we can close the door up there. You don't see anything on the outside. And then that drops it. And then there's a 40 foot auger that's right up against the trusses. Along the outside walls, we got what they call a curb. And this is all my idea, just like you'd have in town. So if there's any water or it happened to get on the outside of it, it's got to get over that six inch curb. And there's an extra two by six around the bottom. We figured that would make a bump board for the skid loader. There's some angler braces. You, this thing I've got my hand on here, it's got angle braces that go back down to the floor and that everything gets anchored to the floor. And we've not had one thing move on us since we've put it in. We thought it would hold 32,000 bushel and it looks like it would. Uh, there's, uh, so we've used it successfully with not a bit of damaged or spoiled grain, not one bit. The beautiful part about it is that we can use it for something other than just storing grain. Uh, the grain bins and we've got over 120,000, I guess, bushel of grain storage, uh, regular storage, but we can't use them for anything other than storing grain. More information, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. Lori Bedord investigates the technology of food tracking. Rob Sharkey is back with his unique perspective on agriculture. I head to auction to see what a late model New Holland BR7070 round baler is selling for. We feature a beautifully restored Ford 871 classic tractor. All that and more next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.